Hi, uh, thank you so much, uh, and thank you to Beruz for inviting me. I came to my first creative mornings back in uh, June, uh, at the end of June, which was the end of Sparks season, and I left feeling really creatively inspired, which to feel that way at the very end of a season is really saying something. Um, uh, but that said, I'm not so much going to inspire you as um, hold your feet to the fire a little bit. Uh, I want to talk about the future of data and the role of designers in shaping the information and the meaning that we create from that data. We're in the early stages of a new ecosystem of information, a watershed moment that's radically transforming social institutions from work to education to politics as information radically switches from being scarce, authoritative, top-down to ubiquitous. You'd think I would know how to do this, right, being a broadcaster? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. Um, as information switches from being this top-down, curated, authoritative source to bottom-up, ubiquitous, and highly dynamic. And in particular, the digital data that we're generating about our everyday lives can and will be used to change the real flesh-and-blood, bricks-and-mortar world around us. And in order for us to get the future that we want, people in general, but people who understand design in particular, need to get involved in shaping the conversation about how we use our data. As citizens and as designers, we need data activists, much in the way that we might talk about people being political activists or environmental activists. So the change I'm talking about this morning is going to have specific significance for those of you involved in uh, designing websites and apps, but I actually think it's important for anybody uh, in design because it reflects a change in the context in which you're designing, as well as the things you might want to design in the future. So what do I mean by this idea of the digital data we're generating about our everyday lives? Well, I'm talking about stuff that you probably already do. Perhaps you are a quantified selfer, a take a picture of everything you eat before you eat it person, or a Pinterest fan, okay? If so, this will all be familiar, but let me um, break down for you what I'm talking about quickly so that we can kind of get a handle on what we're talking about. I'm talking about the growing body of practices of tracking, what you might think of as the statistical minutiae of everyday life, just the sort of ordinary behaviors that we have and how we're starting to keep track of those and share them. So the first kind of broad area of this is tracking your body's performance, literally tracking what you are doing physically. So that could be anything from uh, wearing a Fitbit or tracking your runs on your Nike Plus, um, or it could be checking in with a location-based service like Foursquare, or it could be something more personal, such as tracking your mood, which is a common practice for people with mental health issues. And a whole other area is the way we're starting to essentially do this kind of digital temperature, temperature taking, documenting our reaction to the world around us. Um, so that might be anything from leaving customer reviews at a service like Yelp or registering our responses to the movies we watch on Netflix. And not always necessarily because we're actively trying to engage in this process of tracking, but just because we're starting to find it useful, right? You're not necessarily tracking, um, reviewing the movies that you watch on Netflix because you want to keep track of it. You're doing it because it'll help you get better uh, movie recommendations. Um, or it simply could be uh, tagging other people or the copious photographs that we all take and share on Instagram. Um, people upload 300 million photos per day to Facebook alone. And as video sharing sites and facial recognition technology take off, we're going to have ever more visual captures of what's actually going on around us, what we see around us. Another area to sort of think about is location-based documentation. As we saw recently with Apple's ill-fated first attempt to replace Google Maps with their own system, there is incredible heat in the mapping space now as more and more of our online activity uh, takes place using mobile devices and more and more of the data we're producing is tied to real physical locations. I'm actually working on a mapping special right now uh, for Spark, which is just a sign of how geeky the show can get, but I'm making a mapping special. <laughs> anyway, I'm, very, I'm actually very excited about this. Um, we check in, we have GPS stamped images. We're encouraged to annotate the world around us, for instance, using Google's map maker feature, where we add our own local knowledge to Google Maps. 
And then, of course, there's a kind of inadvertent tracking that goes on in virtue of using digital tools that know, in quotation marks, how they're being used. So if I read an e-book, the reader knows how the book is being read in a way that a paper book does not. And as we replace our analog tools with digital ones, tracking our behaviors, uh, in some cases, whether we actively choose to or not, is going to start to be normal. This is really part of what I think is the key um, piece of all this, is once we switch from analog to digital, we start seeing this, um, this kind of change in terms of the ability to automatically capture and share information. And that's where the key component of who gets access to that data, how does it get shared, who owns it, all those questions start to emerge as we make that switch from analog to digital. And if you look kind of back at the last sort of, say, f not even five years, like three years, how many things that people commonly used to do using pen and paper, they now use um, digital devices for. Um, and it's simply because it is in the affordances of digital technology to know, uh, again in quotation marks, how it's being used. And so for designers in a digital context, when those affordances are baked into the technology, as we'll explore, you need to make real decisions about how you're going to design for the use or abuse of that data that's collected. Uh, it's not an add-on, it's constitutive of working in the digital space. And of course, it's not just in the proliferation of apps and e-readers and Fitbits and all that, the things that we carry around with us, it's the coming growth of the Internet of Things, sensors and little bits of computational power dispersed in the environment around us that collect information about everything from where the next streetcar is to air quality to numbers of people passing through a given location. And digital, of course, makes it easy to share that information with other people. We know this. This is why we love social media. 20 years ago, it was technically possible for me to keep track of the reading that I was doing. You know, it would have been onerous, but I could have done it. I could have kept a little piece of paper by my bed and kept track of what I was reading and how long it took me to read it and the times that I was reading and all that stuff. But then what? You know, I could stand out on Queen Street with photocopied bits of paper handing them out, but I'm not likely to be very effective with that, right? But once I can do this uh, digitally, capture that information easily and share it, not randomly with people on the street, but with people who uh, might actually be interested in what I'm reading, then suddenly what was trivial, banal, um, pointless even, suddenly becomes actually useful. And we know this, right? We know this about, the, about digital um, culture. We know this about social media. But I think we don't often reflect on what that actually means for the culture of information. That information that is completely banal in an analog context can become useful in a digital one because we can connect it to people for whom it has meaning. And that's thanks again to the affordances of digital, that the data can be taken from one context, uh, my device keeping information about my reading, and put it in another, an online platform for readers to compare notes, say. So this is where it starts to be about more than an odd preoccupation or this quirky thing that we're all doing about tracking what we're doing. Because it turns out that when you start to aggregate that data about what people are doing and where they're going and what their moods are and so forth, you can actually start to learn some pretty interesting things about the world around us. And more than that, it does this curious thing that it changes the kind of information that we see as valuable. Um, for instance, let me take a look at the idea of what the city of the future might look like as a result of all this self-tracking going on. And this is, I know it's a huge buzzword about smart cities and all this kind of stuff, but I think beyond the buzz of it, we can think about how we might use this ability to self-track to um, encourage more responsive, more dynamic, and more sustainable urban environments. So let me offer a simple example that actually exists in the real world right now. Uh, who uses a GPS navigation device in their car, the kind that says turn right in five minutes or whatever? Okay, well, you know what they are anyway. So Google has a navigation tool. I don't drive it anyway, so I've heard them of them, though. Uh, <laughs> Google has a navigation tool that operates much like all the other GPS navigation tools out there, uh, Navigator. So if you have this little GPS-enabled device, you can use your Navigator, uh, much as you do with all these things, to find the best way to get someplace. You say you want to go to um, Queen and Dufferin, and it directs you to turn right in 25 meters or whatever. And it can do that, of course, because it knows, again, affordances of digital, where your car is. Um, the satellites ping your car's GPS periodically, and because it knows where the car is now, where the car is now, where the car is now, it knows how quickly the car is traveling, right? And because it knows how quickly the car is traveling, that's a pretty good rule of thumb indicator of how uh, light or heavy the traffic is. And so with your permission, uh, Google anonymously, along with other drivers' uh, information, can make what's essentially a live traffic map. So when you go to Google's live traffic maps, um, 
red is where the traffic is moving uh, slowly, amber is where it's so-so, and green is where it's uh, moving quickly. I think I must have taken that screen capture at 3 o'clock in the morning because it's not usually so green, really. Um, and, it's, and right now in this early stage, <clears throat> it's combining that live information with kind of more stable information. But I think you can take this kind of thing and see where you might be going in the future as you have more and more of this constantly updated information. But what's really cool is when you take this to the next level, right? So you're driving along and you suddenly see, oh, Queen Street is red on Queen Street. I'm going to change direction. I'm going to go along King Street. Um, and so you change where you're going. And then that information gets fed back to the live traffic map and turns up on your, um, your navigator. And then you change your direction again. And then that information gets fed up and so forth and so forth. So what's happening there is a kind of continually updated feedback loop between your behaviors, the stuff you're tracking, and what's going on in the digital space. And this is happening now, so think about what might happen down the road when uh, we multiply these kinds of automatic feedback loops times 10, times 100. How different an urban space might look when you have this kind of ongoing feedback loop bet between the information that you're generating about your behaviors and um, what's actually happening in the digital space and how that's reflected. Um, and that's, again, not because you're particularly choosing to um, keep track of where your car is going. You just want to get from point A to point B in the quickest way possible, right? It's just that these digital trails that are left behind, again, affordances of digital, um, that this happens. So that's what's happening just from the passive generation of data. But we could also think about, and this is where the idea of data activism comes in, what happens when we choose uh, what we want to report on. And again, let me give you an example that exists right now in the real world. Uh, who's heard of Ushahidi here? A couple people. So Ushahidi is uh, Kenyan technology that was created in the wake of post-election violence there several years ago. And what it basically did was allow people to send via SMS little... Um, quick updates about uh, violence that they were witnessing, uh, partly in order to bear witness to it and partly in order to track where it was going. It was just a simple tool that was created, open source, that let people do use the technology they already had, sending text messages, to plot on a map where activity was going on. It was very successful. It's been spread uh, far and wide since then. It's been used in Japan in the wake of the earthquake and the tsunami, uh, in Haiti after the crisis there. Um, to monitor election irregularities in India and in the U.S. So when all these pieces come together, you've got self-tracking as a cultural phenomenon, you've got the ability to aggregate the data, you've got sensors in the environment, and you've got continual access to this information through mobile technologies like our phones. We have this very different ecosystem emerging. Uh, I think of it as a data map, a highly fluid, increasingly public, location-based set of information, a digital doppelganger of the world around us. And the power for bottom-up collaboration uh, on information systems that are immediate and responsive is compelling and powerful in making um, smarter communities, in designing services that build off this cultural urge to track and share, but create opportunities for the generation of actual useful information beyond what we've mostly seen so far, which is the generation of information that's useful for marketing. So I hope... I've convinced you somewhat that the opportunities um, as the design of something like Ushahidi or live traffic maps suggest are enormous, as are the opportunities for social engagement, for encouraging a new kind of citizenship based on this idea of data activism. But so are the challenges and responsibilities for designers. So at the risk of being a giant buzzkill on a Friday morning, uh, I'd like to flag some issues and questions that you might want to consider in your own practice or in your own use of these tools as citizens. So as savvy tech designers, where do you sit in all this? What are the issues that you might address in the work you do? Well, I'm a journalist, so I have questions and not answers, but here are my questions for you. Um, first of all, privacy. You knew I was going to say this, didn't you? Um, but think about one aspect of privacy for design in particular, which again takes us back to the idea of the affordances of digital. And that is the implications of the ability of digital to easily decontextualize and recontextualize information. So for instance, here's something I learned about at another conference this, uh, this fall that kind of freaked me out. This is a picture from a rally before the final game of the Stanley Cup in Vancouver, the one that ended in the Vancouver riots. And it's actually a composite of more than 200 photographs stitched together. Uh, it's technology called Gigapixel. And you can find this and more uh, photos uh, freely at their website. 
And if you're in this throng of however many thousands of people that is, you certainly don't think it's a private activity, but you probably think you're anonymous just in virtue of there being so many people in that space. But thanks to really quite astonishing technology that's very high resolution, you can zoom in and in and in. And because we have this cultural habit of tagging ourselves and others, uh, a service like this can say, hey, here's this photograph, sign in on Facebook and tag yourself and your friends. And suddenly, what we associate with what's happening in the street comes this digital representation of this person. So if I click on the little blue dot above that guy's head, it takes me to what seems to be his Facebook page. And this, again, is the nature of digital technology, that ability to connect information from different data sets. Um, and obviously that's incredibly powerful and it's one of the things that uh, is a highly useful tool. But we also need to think about the context of that. In what sense do we want to connect people between their real presence in physical space and their digital presence? Another question I would say is when you're designing these systems is open or closed, distributed or centralized? So building on this idea that we're uh, developing this new ecosystem, how can design think about the way users are enabled or not to take charge of their own data? So all this data that we're generating is going to be contested ground down the road. The privacy skirmishes that we see play out on Facebook today are just the start of how we'll negotiate who owns what, who can see what and how, and there are two forces that are at work here really. Uh, one is making data more open, more portable, and I think ultimately more useful. And then there's the push to hold data in walled gardens maintained by individual companies. So a question to consider is, is there a market opportunity in giving people the chance to easily manage their own data? And we've seen some embryonic attempts at this, um, such as the social networking service uh, Diaspora that tried this out. Are we going to see more of this as people start to recognize how much data they're generating and what it might be worth? So if you design in this area, how are you going to address issues like open data, data portability, and data ownership? And related to this, if we start creating so much data, and I think we will, such that we're creating life logs of our behaviors and tastes, how does the service or the tool um, that you provide connect to other services that people might be using? Even if your work isn't involved in personal data, is there a way that you can situate it within this new ecosystem? Is what you design interoperable with other services? Are you giving individuals tools so that they can take the data they generate with what you've built and use it with other services? Or is it locked up tight? In other words, what sort of an information ecosystem are you helping to create? One that's heterogeneous, dispersed, but collaborative in a way that empowers the user to be a digital activist, or a walled garden where user data is locked up tight? And I think that while all this data collection seems trivial now, once we start creating data profiles of ourselves, we're going to start effectively running our lives and running our communities, in part at least according to that data. So we have to think about the values that are embedded in the services for data collection. For instance, are these services making assumptions about what a person should pay attention to? Or are we allowing people freedom to shape what they want to track? For instance, when I was self-tracking while I was researching my book, I used a service called Datum, uh, designed by Nicholas Felton, who some of you may know for his uh, amazing infographics work. And one of the things I really liked about Datum was it was completely open-ended. It allowed me to track whatever I wanted. It didn't assume that I was a person who ought to be going to the gym more often or ought to be eating better. Um, because I think the danger with these tools is that they create a sort of performative self, a compliant, consuming self, when what we really want to do is give people the tools to have more insight into what they want to, uh, want to track. And when we think about uh, the values designed into a service, it comes down again to that old idea of the affordances of digital. Digital likes, lists, and discrete bits of information. And businesses that deal in self-tracking like this too because those sorts of discrete lists of information are helpful for target advertising. And that's fine, I don't have a problem with that. But what happens when we get more and more of our information from the lists that people generate and the data they keep about themselves? What falls off the table? Is it really true that the list of causes I support and where I went to school and the TV shows I like and, the school and um, where I work gives a real full and complete picture of who I am? If I had a neutral platform to describe myself to the outside world, would it actually look anything like what a Facebook profile looks like? Or would, would it look more like an analog experience or a blog, be more open-ended and loose? Another question is, are we actually designing the tools so that they consciously support the values that we choose to embed in them, or are we 
kidding ourselves into thinking that what we do is neutral, because technology is not neutral. Technology has politics. And the design and user experience decisions that you make have real impacts. So consider the example of Twitter, right, which has evolved into an important tool for information gathering and dissemination, obviously. The very simple design choice that it was designed so that you can easily follow someone without them having to friend you back in this reciprocal relationship allows for easier access to information than the reciprocal friending of Facebook. Simple design decision, profound impacts in how the service can be used. Uh, for instance, I don't know if you can see this, this is a... Um, a capture that a blogger named Andrew Keith made of the action on Twitter on the 100th anniversary of uh, the sinking of the Titanic this spring. Made the rounds on Reddit and then all sorts of news outlets. And these are people who uh, only just realized on the 100th anniversary that the Titanic actually happened. And that it wasn't just a movie by James Cameron. <laughs> the woman at the top says, is it bad that I didn't know the Titanic was real? Yes, Charlotte. Yes, it is. <laughs> so I think the, the point there, not to make fun of poor Charlotte, but um, if the only access that a person is getting to information is from people who, metaphorically speaking, didn't know the Titanic actually happened, and they can't get outside that world because the service is designed so that people have to friend you back, then you're going to be at an informational disadvantage. Whereas something like Twitter, you know, part of the reason why it's morphed into this powerful tool is that simple design decision. Now, I don't know what values the designers of Twitter were trying to bake into it at the beginning, but it certainly had incredibly profound impacts. Um, and then there's this idea of data activism. What kinds of creative ways can we think about using the data that's being produced? What are the new services that can be the next Ushahidi, for instance? Are there ways that we can make it valuable to the broader community to provide insight as well as being valuable to individual users, yes, advertisers, and so on? As designers, what kind of things do you want to choose to help people track? Maybe there are ways to think really creatively about this question, too. Maybe it's not just about designing the new Ushahidi. Maybe it's about harnessing people's appetite for data generation in games, in contests, in marketing plans, but in a way that uses that data generation to positive ends. Right? Google Navigator doesn't expect its users to be altruistic. It simply harnesses the data that they're producing in virtue of using the service. So even as we're hurtling into this world of the data map, the rules and norms that should govern this new world are very much in flux, and we're mostly left with legacy rules of an earlier analog era, like the standard form terms of service contracts that we all click I agree to without even reading. New norms and standards have to be agreed on. What are the ways that designers can get involved in the public discussion about our data and how we can make good use of it? How can you help shape the public conversation about data? Thinking critically about what information we think is valuable, what we want to collect and why, and who has access to it, is a political act. We can let the decisions simply be made by private businesses. We can let the decisions be made top-down by governments in a technocratic process. But why would we do that? If the data we produce is genuinely, personally, and socially valuable, we as individuals, as citizens, and as designers should play a role in those decisions. And finally, you only have to look at the current proliferation of apps and tools for capturing and storing data and information to see that this is a huge growth area. In the years ahead, we're going to see a proliferation of tools for capturing every whim and fancy, every bite eaten, every calorie consumed, every step taken. It's going to be incredibly easy um, to track information about ourselves in a way that will make the total life logging ambitions of Facebook's timeline feature look like primary school. But what opportunities are there for you to bring real meaning and value to the things that you design? Are these services proliferating like mushrooms in spring? And as they are, how do you become a source not of just another junky app that people put on their phones and then forget about, but a source of real value in people's lives? Beyond just pumping out and storing data out, our, our, out about our behaviors, is there a way to create real meaning for people? A tool that shows people something of real value in understanding their lives and the lives of the community members around them. That's the real contest that lies ahead. It's a powerful and exciting place to be. Thank you. <laughs>